It's a great pleasure to welcome you to the next webinar in our series um, hosted by the Business School. Um, I would like to make you aware that we are recording this session um, so we can play it back and share it with uh, our students who couldn't make it uh, today. And um, there will be an opportunity afterwards for anybody to ask questions and I would encourage you all to use the, the chat facility for that. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Lynn Cadenhead, who is Chair of the Women's Enterprise Scotland, who is going to be exploring a number of themes in the webinar this afternoon. Lynn has over 25 years of management and investment experience, successfully raising early stage business investment, managing technology venture capital funds, and of course as an investor herself. She's worked with a very wide portfolio of technology companies, and was an early investor and the first chair of Touch Bionics, the world's leading upper limb prosthetics company, which sold for £27.5 million. Lynn has served on over 30 boards, is an ambassador for women on boards, and I'm delighted to say a visiting professor in governance and enterprise here at Edinburgh Napier University Business School, as well as being an alumna from the university itself. A serial entrepreneur, Lynn created her own games company and is the founding director of Mint Ventures, a woman-focused business angel investment syndicate. And she's CEO of Immaculate Drinks, a botanical distillate alcohol-free drinks company, a member of the T20, the think tank body aligned to the G20 group of governments and central banks, and finally, in 2020, won the Institute of Directors Scotland Director of the Year for Equality, Diversity and Inclusion. So many congratulations on all those achievements, Lynn. Delighted to have you with us. And I will now uh, pass over to you for the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. And I think it's fair to say that none of that would have really happened if I hadn't actually started off at Edinburgh Napier University all these years ago. So th thank you very much. It really is um, a pleasure to be here with everyone today on this very special day, which is Women's Wednesday of Entrepreneurship Week. Um, just to say we'll have a, a, a brief presentation here. We'll keep it really informal to remind everybody that if you do want to ask questions, you know, we can put them in the chat box, at, ask them at the end. There is no such thing as a daft question. Every question is appropriate. And also a reminder that this is a really safe space for you to ask about anything that you would like to ask. And if you don't feel comfortable about asking things uh, in the chat box today, um, we'll be able to give you my email and we can arrange a follow up call with anybody um, as appropriate. So. Just remember, really safe space and uh, we'll give you some information about women's entrepreneurship. But before we do that, um, just to give you a little bit in, more information about um, you know, my personal journey to, to becoming an entrepreneur, it's uh, fair to say that I've had a fairly varied background. Um, I actually started off in life sciences research as a fungal molecular geneticist, which is really just a fancy way for saying that I studied mushrooms. Um, before moving into sales and marketing in a corporate industry and then into venture capital investment. Um, and that was where I really started to get interested in early stage companies and really deepened my understanding about the, the life of an entrepreneur. Now, there's lots of reasons that um, people decide to become an entrepreneur. And interestingly enough, Money is not usually the most motivating factor. It's much more to do with, you know, purpose um, and, you know, people having an idea that they'd like to, to bring, bring to fruition. But for me, I have to be quite honest and say that I'm actually quite a stubborn individual. I don't like people telling me what to do. And so in order to be able to get over that, I thought, well, maybe the best way is for me to to actually start up and run my own company. And it did help that I had a couple of business ideas that I wanted to, uh, to progress. So um, just, you know, just remember that there's lots of different reasons why people decide to, to become entrepreneurs. Um, as Gail was saying earlier, I've been involved in uh, so many different companies and so many different types of roles over, over my career in this sector. 
and I have had some really good successes, but equally, I have had a number of failures uh, in the journey as a as an entrepreneur. And I think it is important to be to have quite open and honest conversations about the fact that you know many companies don't work in the early stage. Running your own business, you know, can be pretty difficult at times, and there will be lows that people experience uh, along the way. But by the same token. It can be one of the most rewarding and inspiring things that you will ever do when you hold a product in your hands that you alone have conceived and brought to market. When you do that for the very first time, it is one of the most amazing feelings. But there will be challenges uh, for men and women entrepreneurs alike. Um, things like funding, um, ensuring that you get product market fit. You can have problems with staff, employees. Even have pandemics thrown into the equation just to make things uh, even more difficult. But I think uh, the important thing is is to to understand these issues, and also to understand that women entrepreneurs can unfortunately face some additional challenges in terms of starting up and running their own business. But forewarned is forearmed, and when you know that what these challenges are, you can seek to address them. You know, quite quite early on uh, in in the process. If we could move on to uh, the next slide, please, Vladimir. I think important at this point um, just to, to, to touch a little bit about you know, the pandemic and for people to be aware that whilst everybody on a global basis has suffered um, during this pandemic, COVID-19 has unfortunately had some gendered impacts, which basically means and in a business context, um, it's had a disproportionate effect on women. So what you will find um, is that women have had to take on more caring responsibilities. They've had to take on more homeschooling responsibilities. There has been unfortunate uh, increases in domestic abuse and women are more likely to be working in sectors that have been hit by social, social distancing. And Part of this problem is that uh, because for, for many, many years, women entrepreneurs haven't had a voice at the table in terms of where the decisions are being made about you know, how to support women entrepreneurs. And we have a little bit of a stale ecosystem of support. Um, we, we tend to use the phrase male, pale and stale um, because the system has been, to many extents, been designed by men you know, for men. And that cascades into issues such as inappropriate use of, of tone, inappropriate style of you know, language, inappropriate visuals, etc. And also for funders and entrepreneurial support organizations, not really understanding that women grow their businesses in different ways and tend to have different types of businesses. Um, so we, we work at Women's Enterprise Scotland really hard to try and educate people around the system um, about that. And of course, as I said, you know, there's different types of business owners as well, different types of uh, businesses. You can be social entrepreneurs, you can be a creative entrepreneur. You don't always need to be absolutely focused on, on the business. Being an entrepreneur is more about the mindset that you have uh, up here in terms of driving your business forward. Now, um, one of the areas that I, I do want to discuss, uh, you know, in a little bit more detail, is about access to finance. Because when when you start up a business and and grow a business, you decide that you want to grow it quite significantly. Usually, you need to get um, some funding to be able to do that. You can bootstrap your businesses initially, which is using your own savings, et cetera. You can get some money from your know, friends and families. But when you really want to start to grow a business, you usually have to get external funding into, into a company. It's difficult to get bank money to be able to do that. Um, and equity is usually what people go for, which basically means you sell a share of your company to somebody else in return for some capital to help you to help you grow your business. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about that in the question session afterwards. But with regard to women entrepreneurs, it's difficult for anyone to raise funding for their business. Difficult, not impossible. Many, many people do it, but women face some additional challenges. And some of the statistics that you should be aware of 
are that women ask for one third less money when they start their businesses. This is what the research bears, bears out on a global basis. So say, for example, um, you have a man and a woman looking to start their business. The man would say, OK, I need £30,000 to start my business. That's what they think they need. And they would ask for £30,000. Women entrepreneurs ask for a third less and would only at, usually ask for £20,000. Sorry, my cat's just coming up to, to join us uh, in the webinar. So a man would ask for £30,000 and a woman would ask for £20,000. Next, with regard to the, the amount of money that people actually get, women-led businesses have 53% less capital. So if we use the same example, the male-led business would have £30,000 to actually start their business, but the woman-led business would start their business with less than £15,000. So right from the outset, a woman entrepreneur is undercapitalizing her business. So we need to help women to understand those issues are out there uh, and help them to, to be a little bit more confident in terms of asking for more and getting more to start their business. Um, the most um, horrifying statistic, again, I'm not meaning to, to put anybody off here, forewarned is forearmed, but venture capital investment, which is kind of the next stage of, of funding that you're looking for to grow your business when uh, you're really starting to look about hundreds of thousands of pounds and millions, uh, millions of pounds. A recent uh, report by the Vin British Venture Capital Association in the UK showed that one pence in every one pound goes to male-led businesses. Putting it another way, male-led businesses get 99 times more funding than a woman-led business. Um, so again, putting these, uh, these out there as a demonstration that there is quite a serious, quite a systemic market failure out there, but it can be overcome, it can be sorted. More and more people, you know, within Scotland and in the UK and internationally have now suddenly woken up to the fact that there is this problem out there and lots of new initiatives are being put in place to help overcome these challenges in terms of access to finance. Many women do raise significant amounts of money for their business. And if you're looking to start a business, you know, you can do that too. So, you know, don't be alarmed by these issues but understand that they are there and organisations such as Women's Enterprise Scotland can help you along that process uh, in order to be, able, to be able to do that. So if we could move on to the next, uh, next slide, please. And one of the ways that we can actually help all sorts of organisations and yourself overcome some of these problems that, that, that I have discussed is, is about busting some myths. Because often you will hear people say that women are risk averse, women in business lack confidence and women in business lack ambition. So, first of all, if we talk about women being risk averse, this is without question, probably one of the biggest pieces of nonsense that I've ever heard in my entire life. Women are not risk averse. What women have is advanced risk awareness. It's a completely different thing. And what this actually means is that when women are, are making decisions very often in business, they are prudent, they're careful, they assess a lot thing, a lot more things in a lot more detail before they make decisions. This is actually a really, really good skill for a woman to have because what it does is it makes your business and the decisions that you take quite simply, more prudent and more sustainable in the long run. Let's turn now to women lacking confidence. Again, complete, complete and utter load of nonsense. Women are perfectly confident. More importantly, women are perfectly competent. It's uh, the research indicates that uh, men actually tend to overestimate their confidence and women underestimate their confidence in, in, in business. Where we can sometimes as women have a little bit of an issue in terms of our confidence is in those transition moments when you're moving into different areas of your life or moving into different sectors or moving into different jobs. 
that transition period can sometimes give you know a little bit of a knock to the con to, to the confidence. But again, there's ways and means and support available to help help people around that. But women are confident. And finally, women lack ambition. Not at all. Women in business are very ambitious, but sometimes it can be that um, maybe the ambition that you show as an entrepreneur and for your business is not what a typical male would think about in terms of ambition. Perhaps your ambition is not simply to make as much money as you possibly can in the shortest period of time, but your ambition for your business is to grow it sustainably in line with your values, purpose, mission, ethics. You're very ambitious. You will take a little bit more time to be able to, to get there, but you will do it in a way that is gender appropriate and fits with your skills, values and uh, purpose. So if anyone says to you in the future, uh, as a woman in business, you're risk averse, you lack confidence and you lack a bit lack ambition, I hope that you'll be able to use this information here and turn it around completely because it is a lie and that is a complete myth. So. Um, uh, hopefully that's uh, helped bust some of those myths there. Um, if we could move on to the next slide, please. Um, but on the on the back of that, we need additional support. And um, there is it's very good to to reach out and ask for additional support when you're you're starting up your starting up your own business. And I just want to touch on some of the ways that you know advisors, supporters, you know people in business school, you know anyone you know can can help you here. And we encourage people when they're looking at anything that comes into them from a woman entrepreneur to assess the business opportunity in detail. But then what you have to do is apply what we refer to as a gender lens over this. So you might be seeing, for example, two businesses. This one looks as though it's going to turn over a hundred thousand pounds in 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 a year. The woman-led business looks as though she's going to turn over £50,000 in a year. Is she lacking ambition or is she showing prudence? In her projections, if you apply a gender lens, has she asked for enough money? Because if she hasn't asked for enough money, she's not going to be able to get, get to that turnover. So this is reflecting some of the comments that I said earlier. Do your business plan and then you, along with your advisors and supporters, apply a gender lens over it. You know, am I asking for enough money? How can I get enough money? Am I being confident? Am I being ambitious? But, you know, tempered with my, my prudence. And I think that's a really important, you know, element to, to kind of uh, put, put over there. I think also, interestingly, it's very important for, for people to understand that um, this diversity of thought, you know, having balanced teams in businesses is, is important. The research also shows on a global basis that women power innovation within organisations. And not just that they power innovation, but they power radical, it's kind of like innovation on steroids. If you start to look at some of the, you know, the research around, you know, the number of patents that are produced by companies that are led by women, companies that have, you know, uh, a lot more women in their founding teams produce a lot more innovation and a lot more patents. And this is because you have this diversity of thought that comes from a different life experience, which really helps you helps you grow your business. Um, for anyone who is you know, working with a woman entrepreneur and developing courses and advice for them, whatever you do, please do not pink it and shrink it. And by that, this is a phrase that is adapted from, from the fashion industry. Uh, what you can often find is, you know, courses are developed, um, um, you know, for general, you know, for, for all sorts of people. And then what happens is they, they take a little bit of that information down they lessen some of the words in it, reduce some of the terminology, and they put a nice pink, you know, ribbon across it, or put it in pink and in purple. They pink it and they shrink it. That is absolutely not the right way to give advice to women entrepreneurs. Whatever you do, don't pink it and shrink it. What you need to do is use this gender lens approach um, that that we that we discussed earlier. Um, and I think it's also important um, for women entrepreneurs to remember that 
a thriving economy needs all sorts of companies of all sorts of shapes and all sorts of sizes. And sometimes what can happen with, you know, economic development agencies, for example, which are the organizations there to support, you know, growth and scale up businesses, you know, maybe you don't fit into cybersecurity or the latest life science, uh, you know, sector or the sectors which are sexy at the moment. Women uh, operate in lots and lots of different sectors. So if anyone, you know, comes to you and says that you are just a lifestyle business, please, you send them back to me and I will have a chat with them because everybody works to fund their lifestyle. Anyone who's got a job, anyone works to fund their lifestyle. So if you have an ambition to um, take the knitted tea cozies that you've been make, making as a hobby and as a sideline to turn that into a business, what matters is that it's important to you. This is your passion and this is your skill. And don't be put off by what any other any other people are saying, saying to you. And please do come to Women's Enterprise Scotland uh, for additional uh, support, support on that. I just want to actually touch you know, very briefly on side hustles, um, which are basically businesses that you can set up on the side. And what we often say to people is that you, you might be working in a nine to five job and then you can start to do your five to nine job a couple of times a week. Side hustles are an amazing way for any budding entrepreneur to put a toe in the water and see if they would actually like to start their own business. The key things in terms of side hustles, keep it small, um, do not get yourself into any debt, and do use as much free technology as you possibly can, and look on it as an opportunity just to test things out. And if it doesn't work for you first time round, so what? You have made amazing learning experiences, new contacts, etc. Give it a go, and probably your next idea will be a lot better. We see many, many people having maybe three, four, five small side hustles before they actually start on an idea that, you know, really, really means something and is really scalable for them. And again, on womensbusinesscentre.com, we've got quite a lot of information about uh, side hustles, if you would like to be able to, to have a look at that. So if we could move on to the next slide, please. Um, just to kind of touch very briefly on a little bit more about Women's Enterprise Scotland, the organisation which, which I chair. We're a community interest company, which is, is a bit like a charity. Um, and what we're all about is creating a better environment for, for women-led entrepreneurs to start up and grow. Within our team, we have about 200 years experience of gender specific experience with helping women entrepreneurs. And we're here to inspire you, influence and advocate for you on, on your behalf. Now, sometimes uh, it's quite hard to explain what Women's Enterprise Scotland is all about. And the easiest way to explain it is you can think of us as a bit like a union for women entrepreneurs. We fight for your rights. If you've got any problems, you can come and speak to us. Free to join everyone, you know, just, just sign up to our newsletters. It's not a membership. Lots of information available for you. And uh, we work uh, to to work with government uh, on your behalf. I've put information there, uh, a link at the bottom there to the Women's Business Centre dot com. Please go in and have a look at it. Lots of information for you on how to start your own business, if it's right for you, and lots of inspiration and emotional support from women who've already trodden the path. So just um, pop on and and have a wee look at that. Um, and again, as I said earlier, if people have any. Um, additional things that like to know, get in touch with me. So if we could move on to the, the last and final slide. Um, what I wanted to do was just uh, share from you know my experience, my top tips for women in business and not necessarily just for you as an entrepreneur, but really for, for, for any woman in business. Um, and the key one is um, learn to sell. Sales are the lifeblood of any company. And as an entrepreneur, you're always selling, you're always selling yourself, your idea, your vision, your purpose, your mission, you know, aside from actually selling products to, to create sales. And, and sales, you know, it's not a black heart. It's a skill and it's a skill that can be learned. And the sooner that you can learn to sell early on in your career, the better you will be, be positioned uh, for, for success in business. Um, now, uh, 
get yourself a no coach. Women are notoriously good for saying yes to everyone. We always want to go out there and people please and help as many people as we could possibly can. And that's a great you know, thing to do. But unfortunately, when it comes to your business, it can mean that you lose focus. You're not focused enough on your business because you want to, to do all these things to, to help other people and appear on this webinar and you know go to this event. You've got to be really quite ruthless in terms of eliminating things that are not important to you. And if you struggle uh, to say no to things, get yourself an accountability partner, somebody who's working in the same area and you work together with them to say, are you saying no enough? And that's uh, really important to get to get that focus. You need to reach out and ask for help. Um, it is incredible the amount of free help that is available, willingly available to you from so many experienced uh, people as well as your peers. Um, so you really do need to reach out and ask for that help. But again, women are notoriously um, adverse about you know reaching out and asking for that help we feel a little bit uncomfortable about doing that but you have to reach out and ask for that help and whilst i said earlier say no to all these demands on your time the complete opposite applies when you're asking for help don't take no for an answer from anyone keep pushing because the people that ask for the most help most often are the ones that, that get it finally um uh, sorry not finally um, give yourself freedom to fail. This is why I talked about side hustles have been a really good learning experience for you. Accept that failure is an inherent part of the innovation process. Understand that what you are doing will be challenging and sometimes it won't work. That's okay. Um, numerous people have been through umpteen different versions of companies before they've hit on a success. What you need to do is take the, the learning lessons from your failures and apply them, apply them the next time. And do not, you know, on any any occasion feel that, you know, if if you don't succeed the first time, your business is a failure or you are a failure. That is not the case. This is a learning process um, for you. One of the things that we don't talk about enough is um, the loneliness of an entrepreneur. If you're running your own company, you can be on your own. It can be really difficult. And sometimes you don't feel as though you have anybody to turn to turn to. You do if you reach out and ask for ask for that help. But again, be aware that sometimes you might feel a wee bit lonely, which is why you need to build up that um, peer to peer support. Most importantly, um, self care. Um, running your own business um, will be time consuming. You will spend long hours doing this. And unfortunately, people tend to neglect looking after themselves. It's important to look after yourself. Take time out, relax, because a stressed out and burnt out entrepreneur is no use to you. It's no use to anybody else and it's no use to your business. So it's really important to try and get that, you know, work life balance as well. And then finally, in terms of a resilient mindset, it really goes back to this comments in terms of, you know, free freedom to fail. You've got to be able to keep yourself, you know, pick yourself up when things go wrong and keep going. And that without question, this resilient mindset is one of the key attributes of uh, majority uh, successful entrepreneurs that, that I've, I've seen. And, and finally, just to finish up before before we have some comments, um, an, an observation is that um, women are actually 51% of the world's population and collectively women own over 40% of the world's assets. The fact that to date we've not been kind of equally recognised and valued in businesses is not an imbalance in society. It's a social aberration. And Mark Logan, the former chief operation officer of Skyscanner, who's one of our ways ambassadors, is really, really passionate about this in terms of you know shifting the dial for support for, for women in business. But things are changing and things are changing at a pretty rapid pace. So if you are thinking about starting up your own business, uh, you're standing on the shoulders of giants because there's been a lot of progress that's made which should help to, to facilitate the, the process for you. And I think it's up to each and every one of us to, to take on this challenge, um, you know, take these things forward and be the change that we want to see, help other people 
And we need to do that not just for ourselves, but for future generations to come. Um, so um, I know there's been some difficult things to hear in this conversation today, but um, as I've said, you know, on numerous occasions, forewarned is forearmed. There's lots of people able to help you. And without question, starting up your own business is one of the most amazing things to do. And I hope that some of you will take up that opportunity. Thank you. That's unbelievable. As you say that a lot of um, ground covered there in the initial presentation. Um, one comment that's come through uh, that perhaps will resonate with with a lot of people is, um, you know, just the term entrepreneur. You you tend to think about um, you know bigger businesses and and um, ideas that will shape the world and so on. You know, at what scale? Would you say, you know, if somebody's approaching uh, WEN or, or one of the other support organisations, you know, how big or small does it need to be to be thinking this is an entrepreneurial idea? Okay, so there's there's two things to kind of cover off. First of all, um, very often women in business are uncomfortable with the term entrepreneur. The vast majority of women who start out in business prefer to be called a business owner. That's great. That is a really good position to be in because sometimes what happens is you get comfortable with being a business owner. And as you move through your journey, you start to realize, hey, I am an entrepreneur. Um, and you get a bit more comfortable with that terminology. Um, so at the very early stage, you know, depending on kind of, you know, how you feel about it, um, the majority of people um, like the majority of women like to refer to themselves as a business owner. In terms of, you know, coming to, to Women's Enterprise Scotland, you know, for support, the earlier the better. Now, there's lots of terminologies about, you know, scale up companies and growth and all this kind of stuff. I have a kind of journey that I use, which is, first of all, you have to sit up, then you have to stand up, then you have to start up, and then you have to scale up. So this setting up stage is the very earliest stage thinking, oh, well, you know, I've got a bit of an idea and, uh, you know, I might like to think about that. You know, could, could I do that? That is exactly the stage that you want to be coming and talking to an organisation like Women's Enterprise Scotland. And we will help you through that process. We can do quite brief one on one calls. All the information is there. So the earliest uh, earliest that possibly you can come come the better and we will signpost you to the different support that is out there and put you in touch with other women who are maybe just a couple of steps along in the journey so that they can inspire and support you as well so earlier the better even if it's just an idea that's floating around in your head and you feel as though you know nothing about business i mean who knows anything about business when we start up nobody i didn't when i did you know so the earlier earlier the better just in uh, with, with regard to that, you know, there's sometimes a reluctance to to share an idea because it, it might seem simple and easy for others to copy, or or you know, it's not necessarily got uh, an element of intellectual property behind it, so it's easy for somebody else to copy once you do get started. What thoughts would you have for kind of uh, whether that's a barrier people should just ignore or how to protect uh, the idea initially while you're looking for advice and, and potential backers. Yeah, and this th this is quite a difficult area, particularly with the rise in uh, the use of crowdfunding. Um, people do need to need need to be careful if they don't have any any patents. Um, very often, you know, people are, are happy to sign confidentiality agreements. You know, that's um, that is one way to to overcome these issues. But there is also an element of trust um, that you know people need to need to start. You know, to have quite early on in the process. If it's anything, you know, 
really kind of complex, you know, software wise, you know, real kind of technical stuff. Absolutely make sure you get confidentiality agreements in place. But, you know, equally, if, um, you know, you're looking for a different kind of service process, I think the best thing to do is is to go to trusted organisations, you know, regarded organisations, get that little bit of advice. Be slightly cautious in terms of what you release in terms of information and have the conversation with people and build up that element of trust where possible get non-confidentiality agreements in place. But it is a difficult one and I would caution people to take as much advice as they possibly can before they before they go out and do any kind of crowdfunding campaigns. Again, we can help with things like that and talk talk people through that process. Very, you know, there's quite specific requirements for different different companies. It's not a one size fits all with this. Some of the side hustles that you talked about, if somebody's got um one of those potentially uh, um smaller scale ideas shall we say initially to uh, to to work on does wes offer you know does that need a business plan in the same way that you would need if you were going at a much bigger uh, startup where you were looking for uh, investment externally or and if so are there templates that you could give yeah. So again, we, we've got uh, a number of um, fact um, articles on our website about um, side hustles. So just go in and have a have a look at them. Then we've got some information on there about uh, about business plans as well. But no, a side hustle is is just sticking a toe in the water, really. Um, I mean, it might be that you're you know, you're you're great at making you know this amazing chutney or something like that. Okay, well, you know, see if you can pull together a little bit of money. And one of the tips I say to say to people is, you know, maybe think about starting up a side hustle with no more than five hundred pounds. Now, that can sound like quite a lot of money to get, but I would challenge the majority of people to go into their, you know, their house, their garage, their wardrobe, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The majority of people could could probably sell a lot of things online through eBay and raise the amount of money that they need to start up a, a side hustle. It might just be 50 pounds or 100 pounds to buy, you know, equipment and jam and all that kind of stuff. It doesn't need to be anything fancy. You know, you need to have a bit of an idea how much it costs you to make, you know, the jar of chutney and, you know, what you want to sell it out. But you should be able to, to, to write this down on one piece of paper. It doesn't need a business plan. What you're doing is being really entrepreneurial this is cutting edge, bleeding edge entrepreneurial. You don't know anything about there. You don't know anything about the market, but you're going to give it a go. That's what really doing a side hustle is all about. And in time, you will then start to evolve that. And if it's working, then you start to get the help to, to develop the business plan. But no, just give it a go. Is that something uh, you talked about, the mindset being so important? And I guess potentially, um, you know, Recent reports, such as the the British Business Bank's on uh, Alone Together, and which looked to barriers for female entrepreneurs, um, there's uh, potentially a, a challenge and in, in ambition which you talked about. Uh, the reality is that that's more real, more realistic in the longer term. That it's a, a better attitude to risk potentially, but. Would you say that in the past there's been an, uh, a tendency that uh, initially businesses with uh, business owners, female business owners, would raise capital through friends and family first rather than going to uh, you know, venture capital companies or, or looking to crowdfunding? Is there um, an argument there to be, to be made uh, to change that mindset? Yeah, I mean, there's lots of arguments to be made in, you know, terms of so many things related to access to finance. Um, I talked earlier about women being, you know, not being risk averse, which is very true, but women can be debt averse. Women do not like to take on debt. Um, so, which is, you know, by that, I mean, you know, bank funding uh, in into their companies. Um, this is again down to their, their approach to risk and also interestingly um, 
what can often happen is that um, a man who starts up a business, if they have family assets, he looks on them as being his to use to to start business. You know, he might use you know security over the house or something like that. A woman wouldn't do that. She doesn't see the family assets as being hers. She tries to develop her own things, and she wouldn't put the family house, you know, on the line. There, there absolutely has to be a different approach and attitudes. Um, we're working hard behind the scenes to uh, come up with different, you know, funding solutions for women. Equity is a good solution for women, but again, they need support to be able to 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 get there. But there has to be a different approach, you know, in terms of funding. Um, so as I say, we're working away in the background. We've got a wee bit wee bit of time to go, but um, we will get there. There's on funding. I guess there was some great news earlier this year with the announcement from RBS that they were creating a fund. I think it's a billion pounds for female entrepreneurs, but does that kind of capital um, only go to a certain segment of the, the market and potentially um, put off as many as, as it will inspire? Yeah, I think again it's it's quite it's quite difficult, but because you know the use of the word fund is a bit confusing because funds tends to be considered as investment, you know, equity. Um, that fund is, you know, debt availability uh, to to companies. So although it's kind of been made available, women are still risk averse. You've seen it through all the, you know, the C bills and the B bills and things like that. You know, women didn't really take up that uh, that amount of money that was that was there. In your own journey, Lynn, um, somebody's asking. You know, you've obviously been involved. Gail mentioned at the start with. Touch Bionics, uh, which was a, a more uh, traditional, you know, technology-led startup with uh, major backers and so on. Um, but you're also involved now in in um, smaller, uh, no less important, but but smaller scale uh, businesses such as the games company and so on. How do you um, view the marketplace, particularly in Scotland, having changed over the last? five or ten years and the opportunity for, for a business to start up of any type? Yeah, I mean, we, we're actually very fortunate in Scotland because um, we, we have a very well connected community and Scotland's small enough to get its arms around everybody. And there's many benefits in that in terms of the support that's that's available. There are some drawbacks, you know, to having that connected community as well, because you know, people can gossip a little bit, you know, information can get passed around. So we need to we need to be careful about that. I would say there's never been a better time to start start a business. Really, you know, the number of, um, you know, businesses that are, you know, started in downturns, you know, is is phenomenal because, you know, people are like, well, you know, okay, might as well, might as well give it a go. We have a really good environment in Scotland. I mean, clearly, um, you know, there's a huge focus on, you know, digital, digital technology in terms of, you know, digital transformation. But there's an awful lot more kind of direct to consumer as well. And I think there's a change and um, you can start to see a bit of a, a sea change over over particularly the past nine months of people actually wanting to help a bit more local support local businesses, younger entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs. So there's a really, you know, there's a huge, huge opportunity. Um, and, you know, we have a number of unicorns that have come out of Scotland. The, the number of unicorn companies that have come out of Scotland is is quite surprising, you know, given the population that we have here. And these are role models who are actually starting to go out and um, you know inspire the community. And actually, the, the the cashed out entrepreneurs from these really successful companies are bringing a different dynamic to the market because. They actually understand what it's like to start up and grow a company. It's a different form of money. They've got they've got a deeper understanding, as opposed to you know some people who have maybe just you know created their wealth from a corporate environment or you know had inherited wealth. The dynamic is changing. We're starting to get a more entrepreneurial community that understands the risk, and that's really helpful 
for the new entrepreneurs that are coming along. Uh, there's a question that's come through from uh, Kanan, um, who's talking about the, that move and, and the uh, current uh, circumstances with COVID-19, where companies having to compete online with the likes of Amazon, and um, they now need to move online, perhaps think differently about their whole market proposition and face a global giant at the same time. What, what would be your advice to entrepreneurs looking to move into the online and yeah, it, it, it's a tough one. And, you know, the online environment is not a real, um, you know, speciality of mine. I mean, I'm involved in another company called Taxi Game, and um, which is another board game company. And previously, a lot of its uh, sales would have been, um, you know, through through retailers like WH Smith, John Lewis, all these kind of things. That's really fallen off a cliff. About 40% of its sales are simply through Amazon now. Um, and you need to kind of, you know, it's it's not going to go away. And I think the most important thing um, in terms of how to d differentiate yourselves um, is really about your purpose and your story. How do you get your personal story out there? Because what people are interested in is they actually really, really want to hear about, you know, the journey of the entrepreneur. They, they like the fact that you, they've struggled. They like sometimes to support the underdog. So it's that it's really focusing in on that story that you have and engaging with people um, through through different different channels. Um, that's great. And a question from Laura going back to the point on uh, access to finance. Uh, asking, is anything being done to uh, help investors themselves maybe get rid of any biases that they have conversation is about women not wanting to ask for as much as a man but is there more that needs to be done to uh, convince the investors themselves yeah there is a lot of work being done in this area um the british venture capital association report that that came out last year um, it's probably useful for people to know that the chair of that organisation when that report came out was Callum Patterson um, from Scottish Equity Partners, which is a Scottish you know, based organisation. They are doing a lot of work there. There's another organisation called Diversity VC, um, which has started up and there is work ongoing on a global basis to a get more women involved in investment because what we actually need is more women involved in investment making those those decisions and actually writing the checks you're also seeing a growing number of uh, women-led business angel groups starting up and um, so for example we talked about mint ventures we've got investing women in scotland there's angel Aca Ac you're not allowed to call them academy, it's academy, angel academy, um, which are really focused on, you know, diversity. So there's lots of thing, things happening. Um, it is interesting as well, though, there was actually um, a report that came out from the Harvard Business Review a couple of years ago, which looked at investors and how they approached asking questions between male-led businesses and women-led businesses, the investors, um, when they were assessing males for male-led businesses for investment, they were asking questions about, you know, ambitious growth plans, and, you know, really kind of positive questions. When they actually asked the women-led businesses questions about their business, the questions that they asked were all about, you know, how could they minimize the risk? and asking questions about the woman's competence and you know confidence in the business. The surprising thing was it wasn't just men that asked those questions, women investors asked those questions as well. And that was actually quite a shocking uh, reflection on the industry, which made people really stand back. So there's there's a lot of kind of DNI training going on. It will take time. But what you need to do is come to organisations such as Women's Enterprise Scotland, you know, such as the business angel groups in Scotland like Par Equity, Equity Gap, um, Investing Women Mint Ventures, who are really starting to work together to change the dial and understand the, di the differences. So we are in a strong position in Scotland. Um, 
It's a question as well around the, the, the points that you made about feeling lonely and, and working in isolation when you're starting up. And does WES itself uh, organise uh, events and informal catch-up opportunities, or are there other organisations that you could talk you know, help with that. Yeah, I mean, WES itself doesn't um, organise events like that. Um, we will look to do that at some point in the future, but we do have channels that you can engage with in terms of the Women's Business Centre. We will always be available for anyone at the end of the phone who is struggling or at an end of an email. I, you know, I myself have been through this before. I've had the experience of being an entrepreneur and thinking that, you know, everything was going, you know, drastically wrong. I would come into the office every day and think, you know, this today is going to be better. And no, it wasn't. It was it was worse. And then I come in the next day. This is going to be better. And it, it was worse. I have seen myself, you know, lying there, banging my head off a, off a desk, you know, crying, thinking, where, where would I go? I understand the loneliness of it. And WES will always be there for people. So just get in touch with the Women's Business Centre. But in terms of other networks, you can look at joining organisations such as the Association of Scottish Business Women. There's organisations such as Business Women Scotland as well. Quite a number of um, uh, groups that are available. So again, if you, you come to us or you can find out details about them on our website, just have a look through, try things out. If you're ever really struggling, just pick up the phone and get in touch with Wes. It's a follow-up question as well um, from Laura in terms of the way that she, looking at the, the way that you talked about uh, businesses run by women uh, growing in different ways or having a, a different growth trajectory uh, in mind. Um, and she'd be interested to hear about to, a little bit more about that and about how perhaps you present that to potential investors as, as as an asset and not a liability. Yeah, yeah. So the way the way it really translates is um your project you know when you're developing your business plan, your projections will be lower. It will just take you a little bit more time to get there because you have, you know, less access to the capital in the first place. Probably because you're actually spending less time on your business because you're doing more caring responsibilities, homeschooling, all that kind of stuff. So that's what I mean when, you know, it just takes you that little bit longer to get there. So, you know, for example, you might think you'll get to a point in, you know, 12 months, it will probably take you take you 18 months. Um, so it's really all around that kind of, you know, sustainability. Um, in terms of presenting it uh, to to investors, um, it really is um, what you can probably do is have you know sort of three different sets of projections. You know what you think will happen. You know based on your approach, have your stretch projections and then have your your projections that are, are slightly less, and really just talk to them and reinforce the fact that when you're talking to them. You are really ambitious for your business. You have got to talk in this kind of, you know, ambitious, but as a kind of, you know, quiet, self-assured confidence. You know, that's the way to get it across. Um, you know, so that's probably the main things that I'd be able to say. But again, if there's any, it's sometimes difficult to give kind of broad, you know, advice to something like this. If anyone has a question, that is what Wes is here for to help guide you, so we can help more specifically around this. So again, get in touch. Fantastic, and um, we've talked a bit about the infrastructure in Scotland, and it was fantastic earlier this year. Converge Challenge, which is one of the the established routes for um, startups to get funding, had all three finalists uh, led by women founders this year. For the first time, but when you look around, um, you're obviously optimistic for the the opportunities for uh, female founders and and business owners. But um, what are the in, in the last few minutes? Are there a couple of success stories that you would point to to give people that um, sense of inspiration? Yeah, 
In terms of women entrepreneurs in Scotland, I mean, uh, you know, absolutely. If you look at our role models, um, uh, there, was a, there was a picture actually at the start of the presentation. Maybe we should kind of talk through them. Um, at the start of the presentation, there was a picture with, you know, four women entrepreneurs who are ambassadors for Women's Enterprise Scotland. If we look at Lucinda Bruce Gardine, um, you know, a chef, she literally is the kitchen table success. She started her business from her kitchen table to develop gluten free bread because she had three children who had serious um, you know, issues with, with celiac disease. She started her kitchen table for, I think it was about two years consistently. She baked 12 different loaves of bread every single day, tinkering with the recipes. You know, making this little adaption, this li this little adaption. It took her two years to get there. Absolutely consistent approach until she finally felt as though she'd cracked it. So she went from the kitchen table to to Genius Foods to a company that is turning over many many tens of millions of pounds, um, and really transformed transformed that sector. We have other people like uh, Joe Halliday from Talking Medicines. Who has developed, you know, software to help with compliance in medicine? Um, we have Jo McSween from McSween Haggis, who transformed her family-owned business. There are so many inspirational uh, women out there. But what's actually important is, um, at the very start of your journey, it, you can sometimes be intimidated by women who have really reached that pinnacle of success. Which is why you you need to try and you know be inspired by these people, but seek the peer support and advice from a woman in business who's maybe a couple of steps along the journey from you. They'll be closer with you in terms of you know understanding what what you're going through. So be inspired by all these amazing women who are going out there raising capital, right, lefts, and center, building fantastic companies. And build your peer to peer, you know, network of support, um, because there's huge opportunities out there. Lynn, thank you very much. We're, we're coming towards the, the end of our hour. Uh, Gail, I wonder if, if you've got any uh, final thoughts or comments you'd like to. I have, yes, and, and thank you for um, dealing with all those questions that were coming in, Ron, much appreciated. And thank you, Lynn, for your, your words of, of wisdom and wisdom rather and, and sharing your insight and uh, expertise. Um, before we finish, though, could I ask you? Obviously, you've talked around uh, around Wes and the great uh, work and support that that Wes does and that can give entrepreneurs. And you've also talked about your Women's Business Centre as a place to go for help and advice. What role do you think business schools in Scotland can play um, to help female entrepreneurs? I think um, it's really important for the business schools themselves to, to understand the gendered issues that we've talked about earlier on. You know, having a deep understanding that um, you know, women, you know, women are confident, women are ambitious, uh, women are prudent, and use those insights in terms of busting those myths in terms of you know understanding what what the woman is going through, and and really. When you're looking at developing support for these women in terms of support packages, as I said, you need to use this gender lens to develop content appropriately. So, for example, um, you know, if we think about you know tone and language, if you say to somebody, "Are you an ambitious entrepreneur looking for significant capital to scale up your business fast?" You're not really going to get many women applying for that. Because they don't identify with that. If you say, "Are you a woman business owner that is looking to grow your company? Uh, you know, is looking for for patient capital to grow your company in line with your value, purpose, and mission?" You're saying exactly the same thing, but the majority of men in the early stages will identify with the first option, and the majority of women will identify with the second. And that is the power, and that is the importance of using gender techniques in how to support the women-led businesses. 
Okay. Thank you very much for that, Lynn. I um, obviously appreciate that time is, has run out for us. If there is any questions, if we may, we can pass them on to you um, and get responses for anybody that has any unanswered questions. But thank you so much for your time today. We really, really do appreciate it. And so this is recorded and we'd like to make this available to students and anybody else through obviously the, the various LinkedIn channels and uh, social media channels as well to share your thoughts and insights. So thank you so much for taking the time and thank you all to our participants and for the questions as well. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. <clears throat>